Well, good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, wherever you are. Um, everyone who's uh, participating in this 13th webinar of the current series that we're running on Edmund Hutchins's work. Um, the previous seminars or webinars have looked at a range of uh, Sir Edmund's uh, houses and also his, at his design methods. And also the most recent one was looking at the gardens that he designed with his friend and mentor, Gertrude Jekyll. And today we visit one of his uh, most romantic and secluded works, an island and the castle of Lambay off the Dublin coast in the Irish Sea. We're visiting uh, by permission of the present uh, generation of the owners, whose forebears, Cecil and Maud Baring, were great friends of Edwin Lutyens and commissioned him for the works that we're going to see today. Uh, to take you through this uh, webinar, we have three panelists. The first of them is Millie Baring, um, the great granddaughter of Cecil and Maud. And um, how would we describe her very career? She's a polymath, I would say. And her career spans music production, winemaking, and illustration. She's currently based on Lambay, but she travels all over the place uh, in her winemaking capacity. But what she's doing on Lambay, apart from looking after it for the family, is she's running the Lambay Club, which is a group centered on um, the island and dedicated to protecting uh, earth, the earth, the individual, and humanity. You could say soil, soul, and society. Uh, she also produces a really mean range of Lambay whiskies, which are much to be uh, recommended. Our second uh, panelist is David Averill. Uh, David is, um, well, is a long-standing member of the Lutchens Trust and is also a member of the Royal Institute of Architects of Ireland. He has a degree in architectural science from Trinity College Dublin, and he's a partner in the uh, well-known firm of Dublin architects, Shearn and Barry. He has a particular interest in conservation and sensitive adaptation of old buildings to modern day life, um, and is a specialist uh, in working with designers and craftsmen with similar interests. He's worked a, a considerable amount on Lambay Island in, itself. Our third panelist is already known to you, Stuart Martin. Um, he uh, participated as a participant in a recent uh, a recent webinar. He's based in the UK with a practice in the West Country. Uh, he studied architecture at Nottingham University with a dissertation on Lutchins's classical architecture. Um, he has a great love of traditional forms and materials and um, this combination of skills and knowledge have led him to designing a series of very fine country houses. Um, now before handing over to the panelists, I just uh, add two comments. One is, um, for everyone's benefit, you should know that this is being recorded and a recording will be available to revisit if you wish in about 10 days time. Um, secondly, at the bottom of the screen, you will find a little tab labeled Q&A. Uh, please use that to ask any questions you have and um, the questions will, as many as time permits, will, the questions will be fielded at the end um, and left to the panelists to answer. Right, with no more ado, I'd like to hand over, please, to, to the panelists and um, go, go from there. Hey, I, I'll start off, Martin, and thank you for that very kind introduction. Uh, I'm David Averill from Sheenberry, and I've had the privilege of working on Lambay for, for, I suppose, the last 10, 11 years with uh, the Bering family, and uh, it's been an amazing experience. Um, the first slide that we have for you is a view uh, from the mainland across to Lambay. And I should tell you a little bit about the island. Um, the island is approximately 250 hectares or 620 acres, give or take. And it's, um, it's about four kilometers or two nautical miles off the North Dublin coast and is a very prominent feature. And, for everybody who lives on the, the, in Dublin. Um, but, uh, but it still retains a great sense of mystery because a lot of people don't know a lot about the island. And part of the experience of going to Lamb Bay is obviously traveling across on the boat. And um, what I wanted to do was just briefly um, mention this, uh, mention the name of our, of our webinar is uh, Architecture in Arcadia. And for the 
successful and more bearing um, land bay represented a kind of Arcadia. And I, th I think we've talked about this before, Millie, that there's, there's a very romantic story attached to how Cecil and Maud first came to Lambay. And maybe you could tell us a little bit about that. Well, for me, it's um, the love story that, that we're keeping going here as much as we can. Um, my, my memory of it all is that Cecil and Maud bought Lambay as a, a sort of refuge and escape, um, partially due to Cecil's love of natural heritage and, uh, and ecologies. Um, and also he had married at the time a, a divorcee uh, American lady, which was fairly shocking in the eyes of the society. Um, and Lambay really represented an escape for them, um, a, a little mini Galapagos as, as Cecil called it. I, yeah, and, and I think when for any, everybody that visits the island, they get that sense of the, you know, the Arcadian escape, the, the harmony with nature and the harmony of the architecture with nature. And I think it's, a, you know, particularly um, a feature of Lambe and of Lutchen's work there. Um, if we go to the next slide, uh, there's a really nice aerial shot, which I think it gives us a good um, sense of the buildings as you arrive. Um, and I, In a moment, I'll talk about the individual or point out the individual buildings, but this gives you a real sense of the what is essentially two significant groups of buildings, the, the harbour buildings, that, those buildings that are finished with white render and paint, and then the uh, circular, circular wall which surrounds the castle complex of the castle and the farm buildings in the guest wing. And you will see over in a field off on its own is the chapel. Um, so if we go to the next slide, um, we can pick these out. Now you can see the real tennis court, and that's the white wall that many people in North County Dublin associate with Lamb Bay, because that, that's what they see from the mainland, is this, this big expanse of white wall. Uh, that was built in the 20s. Uh, the boathouse was, was remodeled uh, and beside the harbour uh, when Lutchens came to the island. I should say that Lutchens first came to uh, Lamb Bay in around 19... 05, um, the, the island had been purchased about 1904, and initial works had, had started, but the uh, Cecil and Moore decided that they needed somebody with a greater uh, sympathy for the, for the buildings and for the island, and that, that's where they engaged Edwin Lutchens. Um, the Coast Guard cottages are that long row of cottages in the middle, and they were already extant, and they were date back to the 17th century. Um, there's a long building beside them, which is called the Bothy. Now the Bothy was, uh, traditionally a Bothy is a place where people gather or a place of refuge. And for Lambe, I think the Bothy still serves that function as a place where people gather for, for lunch or for meetings or to get together for groups visiting the island. And then you'll see over to this, to the uh, left is the, or the right, I should say, there's the White House, which was built in the 1930s. And this was to cater for the expanding needs of the family as they came to visit the island. And it became a sort of family guest house and still serves a function of welcoming visitors today. Uh, the chapel was extant when uh, the Bearings bought Lambe and we believe it was built in the early 19th century, but was uh, altered and adapted by Lutchens with the addition of a, a Doric portico. And we'll look at that a bit later. And then of course, in the middle of the island is the the large it's encircling rampart wall, which uh, hides the castle. So we should move on and have a look at the map of the island. As I said, about 250 hectares approximately, about uh, approximately a half of the island is cultivated. And uh, that's this side of the island that faces the mainland, you can see. And then there's a much rougher uh, terrain, much more wild over on the side that, uh, faces towards the Irish Sea. Um, it's more or less due north there, you can see the um, orientation. And very obviously in the center is this circular rampart wall, um, which we'll talk about later how Lutchens worked with the existing uh, wall that surrounded the castle and added a layer of geometry and uh, order to the uh, way that the architecture related to the castle. Um, Looking at the, um, the two ordnance survey maps that we have, 
you can see that the castle is there surrounded by a much more um, informal surrounding wall in the 1829 to 44 survey. The Coast Guard station cottages are there and the harbour is there. And the little chapel is, is just below the Coast Guard station on the, on the, the field there. By the time the 1907 survey was complete, the bearings were preparing plans with Lutchens to work on the buildings, but they hadn't commenced at that stage. But you can see that the castle surrounded by its circular wall had had the addition of a number of extra wings and buildings that served uh, to uh, work the farm. And uh, you can see below the circular wall is the square wall garden, which was retained and adapted and enhanced. And Lambay, of course, has been occupied for many hundreds, maybe thousands of years, uh, occupied in prehistory, prehistorical times and invaded by the Vikings. And ultimately, the, the, the reason why the castle or fort, to be more accurate, was constructed in the 16th century was to act as a defense uh, post to prevent pirate attacks on the port of Dublin, which had become prevalent at that time. So if we, if we move on now, this is the 1936 survey, and you can see that pretty much all of the significant works have taken place. The castle has now been encircled by the uh, geometry of the, of the rampart wall. The uh, castle has been adapted and enhanced by the addition of the new square guest wing with its kitchen court in the center. Uh, the uh, buildings at the harbor have been developed and enhanced by the extension of the building to create the Bothy. And right on the sea edge is the real tennis court. I should say that real tennis is the old ancient form of the game that was played by Henry VIII and was, was known in Tudor times. Uh, Lambe has one of two real tennis courts in Ireland. The other one is in the center of Dublin on Earlsford Terrace. And it's one of two in the world which are open air. The other is in Scotland at Falkland Palace. And then below the uh, Real tennis court is the U shape of the White House, which was added, the last significant building to be added in the 1930s on Lamb Bay. So then part of the experience of arriving at Lamb Bay is in a sense, the sense of mystery is heightened. And I think Stuart, this was particularly something that when you came to Lamb Bay, it's, it's, it's such a, an amazing element of Lambe, this, this sense of mystery and, and uh, the wall holds the secrets of the castle but doesn't reveal them when you arrive on the island. Yeah, that's very strong. Um, I remember coming over on, on the Shamrock and you just gradually see those white buildings down by the waterside becoming clearer and clearer. And the sense of anticipation is, is almost unbearable by the time you arrive. And then when you walk up, the path from the harbour even is very, very carefully controlled and the ground is sculpted in a series of terraces and leads up to the um, sort of circular lawn within a curved enclosing wall, you can see on this picture here. And as is so typical with Lutchens, he brings you up on this very carefully controlled symmetrical axis and then doesn't allow you to proceed along that way. And in fact, the visitor's route to the castle here is actually off through that little gate on the right in the picture. And we should, and we should cross across the uh, cross across the field. We should um, show that 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 slide, which uh, Stuart really shows you how you're presented with this grassy field with barely uh, an acknowledged um, pathway to the gateway, uh, which is yeah. shown on the next slide. Yeah, and uh, like I said before, um, when we were talking the other day, I think the other thing about it is that the the nature of the control of the uh, the land itself and the way the stonework of the buildings and the ramparts interacts with it. It recalls to me kind of land art like R Richard Long or James Turrell. And in fact, I was looking at this slide earlier today and I was thinking actually it's also got something in common with Newgrange. Uh, yeah. it, it feels very kind of pregnant with mystery, the whole place. It's, it's, it's very kind of bold and elemental. And we should just reverse very briefly there um, and have a look at the, the buildings that uh, have, are some, sometimes compared to Lambe, and perhaps the most significant is Lindisfarne in the sense that Lindisfarne was um, a project that Edward Hudson, the founder of Country Life magazine, developed with Lutchens. And it was 
the recommendation from Hudson that brought uh, the Bearings and Edwin Lutchens together. But Lindisfarne is, is on the North Sea uh, up, up near um, in Northumberland, near the Scottish border, and it's an altogether different countenance. It's, it's a much more defensible um, perched high on a rock and it feels much more like a defensible refuge. Uh, Castle Drogo was built for Julius Drew between 1910 and 1930 and it's a kind of abstraction of the medieval castle which Lutyens ma managed to make modern and I think we can find echoes when we go into the castle complex of both of these buildings. Um, yeah, I think it's fair to say that Lindisfarne really moulded Lutyens' perception of what a castle could be especially in that sort of thing that it has very strongly that succession of indoor and outdoor spaces and different levels and that great sense of security. Mm. So then if, if we move forward across the field, we come to this beautiful oak gateway, which um, we show here a picture as it was originally executed when the wall was much lower, as you can see, and there was a, a balustrade across the top of the gate, which has been lost. Uh, but the, the sensitivity of the detailing, the understanding of the material and the subtlety of what Lutyens does with the material is so typical of his work and something you find across all his great canon of work. Um, you can see how Lutyens loves texture, even the, the little rounded stones gathered from the beach are used to create texture and a, a sense of arrival. So going through the gate, uh, you enter within uh, you can see uh, we added in a little slide there for a little bit of scale. The uh, gentleman has very uh, obligingly stood on the top of the uh, gate to show how tall the gate is and indeed how tall he is. And also then the cow has very obligingly landed in the field to show us uh, a cow versus gate kind of scale. Um, but if we move through the gate, we come into the, the welcoming embrace of the, of the castle complex. And really, uh, Millie, you, it's like entering a new climate and a kind of a microclimate that sort of uh, kind of wraps its arms around you once you go through the gate. And it feels, even on a, on a windy day, it feels quite different once you go through that gate. It really does. It's, uh, it's sort of like a, a different world. You step in and the temperature changes and, and the atmosphere changes. And most of the year, you've got this incredible canopy of uh, sycamore trees and oak trees above you. So it's dappled light and incredibly magical and the other interesting thing to note is that the castle is only very high at the, front, at the uh, west side so you come in with this imposing gate but as the wall goes around to the back it, it ends up being only about waist height so uh, it's another sort of clever illusion that allows the whole thing to kind of build into the rising hillside behind the castle. And I think this slide shows how Lutyens took the original architecture of the fort with its angled corners, which were built for military defensive reasons, and he's extended them out into the landscape and he's used them as a generator, even for the side wall of the guest wing. And uh, how the geometry is, is there and it's expressed and it links to the other parts of the island and to the views further up the island, but it's never overbearing. That's what, if you pardon the pun, um, it's it's, uh, it's, you never have a sense that there's, there's a kind of overweening axiality or too much geometry. It seems to work very comfortably with the island and with the, with the, with the, the context. That's um, right. The, the most common uh, sort of comment I get actually is the amazing way all of the architecture sort of fits seamlessly into the landscape. And there are hardly any right angles in the whole thing, but you wouldn't notice necessarily unless you started looking in, especially on this map. But it, it drives people mad when they're trying to get the sort of uh, garden edges straight and they realize they've got no, no point of reference. Yes. <laughs> um, but it looks incredible to the eye. There's something very pleasing to the sort of creative eye about it. So it, it looks more natural than it would if it had very straight lines. And our, our next slide, um, you can see on the plan there that there's a, a structure built into the wall. And Lutyens and uh, Cecil and Maud had an amazingly empathetic relationship and perhaps the most empathetic relationship that Lutyens had with any of his clients. But sadly, Maud became ill in the early 1920s and passed away. And this was the occasion for the building of the memorial, so uh, which houses her remains. and. 
Um, I, I, I was thinking, uh, Millie, there's a beautiful um, epitaph on the uh, memorial to uh, Maud, and one of the lines from that is, child cradled in the earth lies here at rest. And I think in a sense, the memorial itself is cradled by the walls of the, um, of the rampart wall. Mm, and yeah. it, it, it's an amazing piece of architecture. Yeah, it's it's amazingly positioned so that the light sits on it all through, all through the day, really. It sort of crosses over and even the trees seem to be implanted so that it gets light all day. It's it's really carefully put in. And, and I think, um, Stuart, you can see how Lutyens was always using ideas from one project to another and how the, the urn taken uh, from the India Gate in Delhi is a sort of maximalized version of the little urns that he... Um, designed for 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 Lambe. Yeah. I think he, he used he used urns of that general format in quite a lot of his um, First World War memorials as well, I think. Um, and the thing that strikes me about this, I, I think there's a real affinity between the kind of the inherent austerity of the the sort of military engineering of the fortification, but then the sort of this sort of it's a similar effect but a different intention in the kind of noble simplicity of the classical elements. And they 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 seem to be you know they're they're in harmony, but not copying if you like. And it's a yeah. it's a magical combination. There's a kind of a kind of juxtaposition of rusticity and refinement which you see across Lutyens' work, uh, and um, you see this in the in the war, war memorial gardens in Dublin as well, where the, the rough um, limestone walls uh, right beside beautifully refined elements. And, and I think this is a very poignant place for the family, mainly because your your grandfather is, is was laid to rest there as well, and other members of the family. So it's um, a really beautiful uh, place, you know, within the walls, within that uh, sheltering embrace. Yes, it's really become the the family crypt, if you will, and Cecil's there too. So he he eventually was laid to rest next to Maud, and then yes, their son and their grandson John's ashes are there. So mm -hmm. it's a, a very special corner for Lambeth. And then, and, and you we... mentioned to us, Millie, that that was one of the best views of the castle as you yes. look out from the memorial. It's a very clever angle because it's not directly facing the castle, but when you stand on the steps in front of it, you do see straight through the trees to the old fort, and it, you you really get the feeling it was placed so that Maud could look over her favourite spot because really she was um, uh, Rupert certainly kind of. Preserve Rupert, being my grandfather, preserved Lamb Bay in in Maud's memory, and it was it was her sort of um, it was her where she still lived in his mind and in his heart. So yes, it's it's nice to think she can look over it from there, as as everyone can now. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And then as as we move towards the, the the castle, or as you say, Millie, the fort, which is probably more a more correct term. You can see how the, the trees have matured and, and almost wrap around the visitor as they come up this, 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 this viewpoint. Um, and uh, we've talked before how he gradually uh, transposes from the rugged and wild of the island to the domestic. So the, the pathway that leads up to the uh, courtyard in front of the castle is grass edged with stone. But then on the next slide, when you go through, you can see that the pathway um, starts to become stone edged with, uh, with grass. The, the trellises begin to kind of bring you into the courtyard and um, a rare experience is to have one of these island uh, residents come and check your tickets when you're um, visiting the castle and doing a tour. So um, we should, the next slide is probably a, a better exposition of the front of the fort and it shows this uh, wonderfully graphic crow-step gable, which was uh, extant at the time, and Lutyens retained it and worked with it. Um, the windows, though, were had been changed, and Lutyens reverted to stone mullioned windows. Uh, the castle is 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 finished in a kind of harled finish, so it has that lovely kind of soft texture, and again. Uh, Stuart, one of the things we were talking about was how Lutyens sets up an expectation, but then steers you away from that expectation because you, there is no door in the center. There are, but rather there are doors to the left and right set within the, the corner towers. And I think it's the door to the left, which is the more commonly used. 
Um, yes, I think you said, David, didn't you, that Lutchen's actually consciously got rid of a door that would have been actually facing you as you arrived, uh, which again is entirely, entirely characteristic. Yeah, and I, I should point out in one of the rooms, I can't remember which one it is, Millie, but there's a little um, bird box that, that children can access from the back, isn't there? Um, uh, I don't know about the bird box, but what's really amazing is he left the um, musket hole, so the, the yes. two sort of side um, anti-chambers, as it were, were for protection of the front door, and there were musket holes on either side that would shoot across to stop people accessing the door, which is where that lower window is straight ahead. Yes. And um, he left it, and he he sort of uh, lined it with wood, so you can open a little door and look. And, and birds do nest in there now, so maybe yeah. that's uh, <laughs> maybe, maybe that's <laughs> a, a, a serendipitous <laughs> okay situation. So. You can just see uh, to to the to the side there is the new guest wing, uh, which was um, added to the castle. And, and the next slide um, brings us through. Um, sorry, the next slide shows a more of an angle, but actually kind of brings into the conversation um, Gertrude Jekyll, the great plants woman and a patron of Lutchens, who um, he he started his career with essentially, and. It, her landscaping plans for land base still survive and they are in the library in Berkeley, California uh, with the Jekyll collection. And you can see one of her typical devices this, is this little um, rill or water channel which runs across and articulates the, uh, out of the courtyard in front of the castle. And that would have been a favorite place for planting irises and other water loving plants. Um, and you can see better the, 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 door, the doorway there set into the corner of the Bastion Tower. Um, but going through then to the next courtyard, which I think is called the North Court, here we can really see um, how the guest wing relates to the fort and how the garden works on so many different levels uh, and relates to the guest wing and, and the fort and how the the style selected for the guest wing is deliberately um, different from the castle and so that there isn't there is that sense of um, which he used I think in other projects like Folly Farm and um, where he, he, he changes the style of the addition but there is a sympathy and empathy with materials and forms that kind of provides a, a connection between the two um, and we were talking Stuart about how um, the, he's, he's brought a, a, a hipped um, dormer to the corner of the fort, which in a sense begins the conversation between the two forms. The, the hipped dormer, in a sense, um, sets, uh, sets the tone for the, for the guest wing. And then in between the two corner bastions, he's added this uh, asymmetrical tower, which provided two large new rooms, which were much needed within the, 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 the castle or fort. Um, the next slide um, and David, shows... It might be worth saying that the, the, um, the bastion that was added was also very important because it made the old fort seem the larger uh, than the added guest wing. So it was very important that the eye was never drawn away from that main event for Lutchens. And it ties in with what you said about um, the slightly different style. Anything he added, it was important that he wasn't taking credit for the original building. So whatever he added was ever so slightly different. So you could see where the changeover happened if you cared to look. Yes. And I think what he, he, the, the, the connection between the two is so light, uh, you know, it allows the view through to the trees and it only connects at the lower level and not at the upper level. So that allows the two forms to kind of be separate but related. Um, and I think that works. And I think uh, one of the uh, consist consistent characteristics with Lutchens are these great sweeping roofs. Uh, he always used a particular pitch for his roofs. Uh, I'm, I'm never quite sure, Stuart, whether it's 53 or 54 degrees. But well, it changed it's... during his career. I think at this point it would have been about 50, 51, and then later it was 54. Yes, and it, but it, it, it really acts to draw the eye upwards to the sky with, with, these, with these buildings. Um, the, we should say that the, the, the building was constructed out of the island porphyry stone, uh, but the uh, fine work uh, at the windows and is from a local limestone quarried on the mainland at Milverton in Skerries, which is close to uh, where the boat used to originally uh, come across from Rogerstown. And you can see how 
the, the, the form of the window is set very flush with the surface of the finished wall and it, the, the, the moldings are almost carved into the plane. So this produces a, an, an amazing sculptural quality to all of these fine elements. Um, I know Millie that it has produced problems with a little bit of water getting in every now and again. But um, they do leak a little bit. It's worth it because they're so beautiful. <laughs> yes, and I think um, I think the hoods were added at some point at the top of the window in an attempt to kind of produce a little bit more weathering. Um, but the the stone, the, the porphyry stone from the island is is uh, you know it's a wonderfully tactile quality and but would not take fine work, you know, would not be, could not be carved to the extent that it was needed for dressings. So therefore he used this very good limestone from the mainland. And that same thing again of the, the civilized, putting the context of the rough wild. It's uh, nice yeah, to see the, exactly. the, the rough edging, which is completely asymmetrical. And then you move into beautifully straight carved edges on the inside and that's uh, yeah. It's a lovely way of making the whole building feel natural. We should say that the original um, roof was covered in a, in a Dutch pantile, but that was replaced. But luckily, the, the pantile that was used still has that textural sensibility, that, so you get a, a strong sense of, of what the original roofs were like. Um, the next slide is very interesting because it shows what Lutyens was greeted with or, or when he came to Lambe originally. And this is the same view that the side of the fort with the uh, dependent wings at the back, which were replaced by the guest wing. And the guest wing itself, Lutchens very cleverly sank into the rising ground so that it, it's recessive in relation to the fort. The fort retains its primacy within the composition. Um, but you can see it was quite a higgledy-piggledy sort of um, kind of medieval meets organic kind of um, uh, creation. Yeah, I mean, it's interesting, isn't it? But it's quite mundane. And I think, you know, we're so used to seeing the finished results of Lutchen's work in all their kind of seemingly inevitable beauty that we, we forget the sheer amount of inspiration that he has to bring to bear and to create this incredible kind of magic place mm. and the number of possible options that he could have implemented, but which he's discarded in favour of the amazing unity of the final result. Yes, it, it, there's a quality to the buildings that you sort of feel in many cases that there's no there's no way they could have been different. You know, they yeah. seem so highly resolved, so so artistically resolved. Um, and it, the next slide it was taken from the roof of the fort. It, it just shows you the scale of the building that he very cleverly managed to uh, recess into the ground so that it didn't overwhelm the, the castle. And in particular, one of the characteristic elements of a Lutyens building is the, are the, the chimney stacks. And here how he breaks the mass of the chimney stack with these little sl slots between them so that they, they break down into you know, slightly smaller elements. Um, stepped back very slightly where, where the, at the top of the chimney stacks. Um, but you know, beautifully handled, beautifully modeled and beautifully kind of uh, resolved uh, as a composition. Um, yeah. We should show uh, the next slide, which is the plan. Oh, sorry. Um, this is within that that um, kitchen court. And you were mentioning, Stuart, um, Folly Farm, which has this wonderful addition that Lutyens added and this low sweeping roof that comes down to uh, what they call the tank court at Folly Farm. But here it's the kitchen court. And Lutyens mm -hmm. also was fond of using dormers as a kind of articulating device on roofs. Um, and I think the dormer, the lower dormer, doesn't actually light anything, it, as far as I recall. It just lights a, a kind of a passageway, but it, there isn't actually a room behind no, that door. That's right. I mean, there are a few interesting themes in here. And I think this photograph's really great because we're talking about the contrast between that progressive element of contrast between the wilderness and civilization. And here, right at the core of Lutchen's new building, you've basically got his most enclosed, secure, most domestic space but at the same time it's also got those themes of that permeation of inside and outside and like you say David the, that little lower dormer actually lighting the corridor which on the plan looks like an internal space but as you walk through the building you're actually outside when you walk through that it's, mm. it's fascinating and very very intricate and, and he kind of acknowledges the primary space within the kitchen court which is the 
uh, the little breakfast room attached to the kitchen with it with a larger oriel window so uh, even within the court he's kind of articulating the different uses absolutely so the plan um, and i should mention that we, we use the term ground floor for the entry level floor and uh, um, our american viewers may use the uh, first floor but what we have uh, what was originally on the uh, memorial volumes plans, which are these. Um, you can see how the corner uh, bastion towers in the castle are, are very sharply angled, as Millie said, for the musket shot. And then how the uh, corner, he built the new sitting room, as it's called, and that kind of incorporated elements of the medieval structure, uh, but created this wonderful um, bay window, which brought light and uh, airiness. I, th I think you're looking at it now, Millie, to your to That's the right. I'm in that very room right now. Yeah. <laughs> and, and it's very clever because it's a north facing room and to get the light in because it's surrounded by the, the terrace gardens and the guest wing and the farm. So to get light in here was really quite tricky and he did a fantastic job with all the clever little angles. So you, you've got as many windows from different angles coming into it as you can and, and the lovely arches behind me um, reflect all that light back into the room. And in the center of the fort is the rectangular dining room, which we'll see later in one of the photographs. And then the kitchen, uh, sorry, the uh, guest wing, the lower level is primarily service spaces, um, storerooms and uh, pantries and so forth. And then when, when we look at the upper level plan, the first floor plan, um, which is the next slide, um, it becomes bedroom accommodation and we talked about how the internal staircase, which runs around the interior of that court, is almost like an optical illusion, like the, what's called the Penrose staircase, where you never seem to um, end. You, you could go around in a, in a, in a, in a circuit all the time. Uh, you'll, you'll notice on the plan of the uh, guest wing, the circular connecting stair, which Hutchins added in, which is a particularly wonderful piece of geometry. And um, also, we should note that there was no connecting staircase between the ground and first floor levels in the castle or fort. So Lutchens brought one in between the two corner towers at the time. And this so, really makes your point, David, that, that look at the floor plan, how much bigger the guest wing is than, yeah. than the original fort. And yet that's not the impression you get at all from the outside. No, his, his respect for the original buildings is, is something that comes through with his work at Lindisfarne and and Folly Farm and Lambay and so many of his other adaptations. It's always there. Um, so and have it, whilst we're on this slide, it's it's a nice place to show that at the back of the old fort, the connecting um, corridor, which isn't shown, uh, is actually underground. So that it's right at the sort of on this map north, but it should be yeah. on the east side of the old fort. You've got a, a, a a corridor that connects the two and it's completely hidden from view so you wouldn't know they were connected from the outside. Yeah I mean the, the, the connection is so subtle that you're hardly aware of it at all. Um, so going into in, into the castle uh, you can see an early and a more recent view of the drawing room or sitting room as sometimes called on the plans and um, the early shot must have been taken quite soon after the renovations were complete because the furniture seems a little randomly placed um, even for the informal um, standards of the arts and crafts movement but here in the more contemporary shot that sort of simplicity and spareness is, is retained in, in the way the furnishings are placed and uh, the, the selection of, of, of furniture. I think um, in the uh, exhibition catalogue to the Hayward Gallery exhibit in 1981, I think Colin Amory characterises it. He calls it Spartan Romanticism. Yes. Turn of phrase. It, it's a very kind of carefully restrained palette of, of selections in terms of materials and furniture styles. And, um, and that's prevalent throughout the castle. It's basically white walls, dressed limestone, and then um, very carefully designed pieces by Lutchens or selected pieces that Maud and uh, Cecil collected with his advice. Um, and I don't know if this is true, but I was told uh, that Salvador Dali's daughter said this was the most beautiful room in the world. <laughs> I'm, I'm willing to take that. <laughs> yeah. 
And I, I think every time you, you visit this room, it, it, there's a kind of calmness about it, which is a serenity, which is prevalent. Um, we should mention this particularly characteristic Lutyens blue that was used in a lot of his interior schemes. Um, and uh, it crops up, I've seen it a few times on early photographs. Um, like you were telling us that the furniture was chosen with Lutyens, it wasn't your grandparents it, were great. Yes, I've always been told that Lutyens would never go to such great trouble to um, create a house for you like this and then let you furnish it yourself. So all the furniture was either um, designed by him to fit the, uh, the dimensions of the room. For him, the proportions were so important or else um, selected by his team, especially for um, Bay. Mm. And I think it, where it works less well is where the clients have actually selected the furniture on their own. Um, because there isn't that sort of sympathy um, that Lutch but I think with Cecil and Moore, there was that enormous empathy that they really understood Lutchens and, and he understood them. So there was never an argument about choosing the right thing. No, um, very much a shared vision, I think. And even you can see the colors they've chosen uh, match the, the uh, tiles, the uh, red tiles and then the gray limestone. It's all sort of, intertwined as if it's all made out of the same materials. Mm. Uh, there's really, really only two, two fabric colors when, and, and it's that sort of restraint, which is, you know, gives it that characteristic arts and crafts quality. It would be very interesting. I think really you said that your grandfather sanded all the floors. Um, uh, apparently so. I think a lot of the main floors were left uh, as they are. You'll see in that original picture that they were um, open but he he took all the varnish off i know that so they're mm -hmm. completely untreated um and then there are areas that have painted bright wacky colors by Maud because she she had that side to her and she she was very clever about it the one that uh, i think of the most is just outside this room and it uh, it hits the sunset light and lights up like it's on fire it's a dark red color so she yeah, had a yeah. playful eye to it as well so we should look at the dining room, which is the next slide. And this is an original room within the core of the old fort. And architecturally, it's, it owes as much to that medieval origin as it does to Lutyens. But obviously, in the selection of, of furniture and uh, furnishings for the room, it, it, it is very Lutyens um, mixed with the taste of Cecil and Maud and has survived so intact over the years. Yes, he designed... Sorry, Sorry. Uh, the table was designed by Lutyens as well as the chairs, and that was specifically for this room. Amazing. And then, I was going to say, the fireplace is a new fireplace, isn't it? That was inserted by Lutyens. That's right, yes, and they're all completely different to each other. So there's, again, there's no lack of having fun and, and experimenting in each room. Yeah. Every, fire, every fireplace is different, and this is one of the great... Uh, chimney pieces or fireplaces within the castle is the, is the bedroom above the drawing room um, where this wonderful um, stone, uh, which I think has a, an inscription on it for in this room, Calypso was born, is that correct? Um, That's right. Yes, 1905, it's on the left side by the wooden door and it, it in Latin it says she was born here in this place in 1905. And this wonderful barrel vaulted ceiling above, above the fireplace and uh, um, and then beside that, we can see the new staircase inserted into the into the fort between the corner towers and this wonderful uh, joinery, very characteristic joinery uh, at the balustrade and mural posts. And um, yeah, just... and like we were saying, David, the ceiling in that stair hall very, very like the ceiling in the long gallery at Lindisfarne. Yes, and there's actually a, a couple of uh, the, the galleries in the top floor of Drogo that are quite like this as well. Mm. Uh, so the, the same ideas. And this is one of the great um, tours, de for tours de force, I should say, um, of Lambe is this um, amazing spiral connecting staircase in the guest wing. And we were talking the other day about how this was done in the days before computer and how he calculated the geometry um, is such an amazing uh, achievement, yeah. really. Um, There's a lovely so quote from, um, from the Hussey Life of Lutchen's and the house he's talking about Lindisfarne, but I think it applies to this. And he says, the poetry of the building derives from the effects having been got almost entirely by structural means, walls, vaults, apertures. 
and in the avoiding of all but the broadest suggestion of period. And consequently, there's no hint of faking and so of make belief. The new masonry is as generously devised as the old, but the profiles are not copies. They are solutions attained by reviewing the old traditions afresh. The romance is real. I love that quote. Absolutely. And there's a kind of Pyrenaean kind of kind of complexity and grandeur, even though it's quite a small staircase, it feels um, bigger. Um, yeah, it's a masterpiece, isn't it? There's, there's another... Sorry, sorry. Dave. The, the clever thing about this staircase is it's the only logical way to complete the guest wing, because as you were saying, it goes up and down in this extraordinary way. So you never really know if you're on the ground floor or the first floor. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and, and once you get to the bottom of this staircase, you're on the first, uh, the ground floor, first floor of America. And as you go round the quadrangle, you end up at the top of the spiral staircase without really realizing that you went upstairs. So it's, it's a genius way of bringing the two levels back together. <laughs> and we should um, move along to the, this, this slide is taken um, from behind. That's uh, the, the castle and shows how the guest wing and the roof of the guest wing sweeps down, the rising ground is accommodated, and uh, again, the castle retains its primacy. Then looking from the roof of the castle back towards the rampart gate, again, you can see this idea of the domestic gradually taking over the rustic um, as the, the, the grass pathway is replaced by stone. I love the way Lutchens has these sort of almost metaphorical versions of castle elements, the way the gate looks a bit like a portcullis and the rill is a bit like a moat and the path could be a drawbridge. It's all kind of, yeah. you know, nearly a castle. <laughs> but in a very, a very gentle yeah, sensibility. Um, My grandfather Rupert actually did always used to say that the water feature wasn't a water feature, it was a joke moat. And <laughs> it pleased the children who said it wasn't a real castle unless it had a, a moat. Yeah, yeah exactly. exactly. <laughs> this, this is the chapel you can see in the photograph as it was before um, the alterations. Very simple rectangular chapel. Um, and Lutchens really added this amazing um, Doric portico and it ties in with uh, Cecil's love of, of, of the classics and, um, uh, and my understanding was he taught Maud to, to understand Greek so he could uh, read Homer to her on the island uh, and then you can see how the, 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 this little temple really has been created uh, to instead of what was there before and as um, you know, as, as, as you said, Stuart, you could be in Paestum or one of the great classical sites yeah. of the Mediterranean. It really um, feels like that. And it's another one of those things, as you were saying the other day, David, where basically a lot of what Lutchens did on Land Bay or throughout his career, you, modern planning regulations just wouldn't countenance. No, no we, we might have to do a zinc box at the back, maybe, if we're... <laughs> yeah, exactly. At, at, the last one at, in front. at best. Um, we should look at the White House from 1932, and this is a very interesting plan. Uh, the two wings were designed for uh, Daphne and Calypso to bring their families to, to stay, and the central wing with, had uh, communal rooms, communal spaces that they could gather together. And um, this, the White House is still welcoming guests, isn't it, Millie, to this day? Yes, the, the family, extended family still come every year, so descendants of... Uh, Daphne and Calypso, and um, and we run retreats and uh, a few private bookings for for Lutchen's lovers as well. Mm -hmm. And it, it's it, in its own right. I mean, the White House is a worthy building of, of ex examination. Um, yeah, I mean, it's a gorgeous. I love the like you were saying right at the beginning, David. The way all the buildings down by the harbour are that kind of white painted, rendered intentionally very domestic. I think. And we were saying the other day how Lutchen's always wanted to build for Emily a sort of middle white house. And, you know, here it is with its feeling of kind of summer holidays and children's laughter. It's just fantastic. Really. Not so little, but definitely one. No. <laughs> um, and then there are some good slides looking from the beach back up towards the harbour building. As you can see the White House with its pantiled roof, which I think is actually surviving from the 1930s. It's, it, it wasn't replaced because they're a different batch maybe of tiles have lasted the longer and there you can see the very sort of simple form of the real tennis court out in the in the mid-20s 
Um, the next slide really shows how incredibly sort of graphic and simple this wall um, presents, the face it presents to the sea. Uh, and Millie, there's a connection with Tuxedo Park in, in, in America, which is um, one of the reasons why the, the tennis court was constructed. That's right, yes. Um, Cecil met Maud uh, in America and she, uh, her father owned Tuxedo Park, which is a, a large estate um, in New York. And he commissioned the real tennis court there with, actually with Maud's first husband. Um, and uh, so it was really a tribute to how they met in their, and the beginning of their love story, which led him to put the real tennis court in here. It was, it was constructed around the time she died. So I think it was a, a completion of their story together and, and Nambe really represented that, that story. And uh, we should also talk about how Lambe is such an exceptional place from the point of view of the ecology of the island and the different species of animal, the, for, the flora, the fauna. Here are the wallabies, uh, which I understand originally a little uh, surplus supply of wallabies were brought to the island from Dublin Zoo in the 70s and they found it to their liking and have settled very happily and there are now over a hundred wallabies on the island. Well over a hundred. I, I uh, believe the rumour is that there were originally meant to be seven females, but it clearly didn't turn out that way. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and, and Lambay, of course, famous for its seal colonies, which are, uh, you know, wonderful. Whenever you arrive at the harbour, that seals are there ready to greet you with their heads popping out cu with curiosity. And also um, the bird sanctuary that Lambe is, is internationally renowned. Um, puffins and cormorants and so many other species are, I think scary sea tours run these um, bird watching visits to the island, which are very popular. And of course, deer gathering in the evening light. Um, they're mostly found on the other side of the island, but you said, Millie, they sometimes um, come down. To they the do, the, the, in the morning, you see the traces of very, uh very adventurous wallabies and deer all over the uh, beaches and in front of the castle as well. And this final slide brings us back to the sense of Arcadia, mm -hmm. the, the uh, marriage of uh, isolation and harmony with nature. Um, and one of those amazing double rainbows that occasionally crop up and you have to get your camera out in double time, otherwise it'll be gone in two minutes. But uh, um, so I think that, that brings us to the end of the, the, the slideshow. And uh, uh, you're going to uh, say that lovely quote from Weaver, David, that you read earlier. Yes, there's, there's, a, there's a lovely quote from Lawrence Weaver, who wrote one of the great books about Lutchen's houses. And in the last paragraph about uh, Lambay, he says, we sail out of the little harbor of Lambay with a feeling that Prospero has been that way and laid an enchantment on the island that history and nature conspire to make real and abiding. So, um, Which is particularly lovely as my Christian name is Miranda. So it feels yeah. very poetic <laughs> that I ended up here. <laughs> thank, thank, Millie, thank you for sharing your home with us today. It's been wonderful and we'll take a few questions and then um, I'll wrap up at the end. But these are some of the very generous people that allowed us to use photographs for this and we thank them very much. Yes, thank you all very much. Um, I'll go through uh, some of the questions and the time we have. Um, the first one was from Mark White. He says, um, there must have been several years worth of conceptual persuasive sketches then with hardline autograph drawings by Lutchens later worked out then in formal office drawings. Is, uh, is there preserved continuous sequence of such documentation for the work on the island? Um, well, I know that the, one of the tragedies of Lutchens was that a lot of the drawings were lost after he passed away. Um, I don't know whether you have any family drawings in the archive, Millie, or? Uh, I would have to check, but uh, not that I've seen personally. And as my understanding was it was an extraordinarily quick uh, transition from deciding to do the project and, and implementing it. So, um, and, and even the building itself only took two years to do all of the renovations in the castles. Mm. Um, I don't know how many drawings he actually did before he just went for it. <laughs> okay. so there was about three years between the initial visit to the commencement of construction, wasn't there, from 05 to 08? 
-hmm. So I suppose he had a little bit of time to put together, but uh, uh, there's an extensive collection of drawings in the Riva drawings collection, though, I think, um, where the majority of the, the office drawings were. Yeah, were, and were, like we were saying earlier, there is actually a reproduction of Lutchen's office working drawing for the main stairs in the castle in the back of the Weaver book. Hmm. David, or Stuart, is it worth mentioning how uh, Lutchen's actually got his concepts across to his, his clients with his versions and these very quick sketches that he would do and show them to the client and throw them away if the client didn't know, and do another one in minutes? Yeah, I think he was incredibly fluent like that as a draftsman. And uh, you can see it in his cartoons of his um, clients and all the rest of it as well. But I, I imagine he was very able to just literally kind of draw it in a few strokes and say, it'll be like this. Mm. Mm. And, and we should say, Martin, that he usually lived in the same building as his office. So um, he would go down in the evening after his um, uh, workers had left and actually put transparency on top of their drawings and correct them so that when they came in in the morning, they'd find a, a Lutchen's overlay on top of their drawing just to get a detail uh, as Lutchen's uh, wished it. Excellent. That uh, last part kind of builds into this next question we have. Um, architecture is a collab, uh, this is from Gary Brewer, architecture is a collaborative art. Could you discuss the builder, artisans, and anyone else from Lutchen's office who might have contributed to the design? Well, I know that Lutchens was very happy to be allowed to use his favorite builders on Lambay, who were not Irish. They came all the way from, uh, I think they came from rugby. Is that right, in Warwickshire? Yeah. I didn't yeah. know where they came from, but David says yes. But, um, but there's a lovely um, plaque in the uh, study. It's another beautiful piece of limestone carved in with the sort of story of how the building uh, works were done. And it's Parnell and Son were the builders. That's right. Yeah. It's all in Latin, yeah. again, there's lots of puns in it. Lutchens loved his Latin puns, um, but he does feature, he says the building was all done by Parnell and Sons. And then there were a great deal of people brought over from the local mainland, um, one of whom died sadly during the building of the wall and there's a plaque for him as well. So the, there was a lot of uh, goodwill and a lot of love between them, which I don't know much, but I can imagine a lot of builders and architects struggling with each other. <laughs> David, mm -hmm. you'll know more than me about this. And well, I think, I, I think Lutchens was, was particularly empathetic with the builders yeah. because he, he grew up in the Surrey countryside, sketching and visiting workshops and joinery shops. And he loved talking to the builders, the, the people that were actually you know making. Um, so I think he had a real understanding of what was involved in, in creating stonework or timberwork or joinery or um, so I think that translates to his buildings. Mm. Uh, and you can really see that in the way he knows how to use the materials so well. It's, yeah. um, it's next level. It's, it's not just constructs for me. It's I want this texture and I want this feel. And it's all to do with what's available around in the local area as well. Time for one more question. Uh, yes. Um... The next question we have um, is from Yves uh, Hedema, and uh, the design is, um, I believe, speaking about the chapel, the design uh, was about the time Lutchens became interested in classicism. These influences are clear in the chapel, but do you see these influences also in the guest wing? I wouldn't say particularly in the guest wing. Um, I think the, the guest wing is still rooted in his kind of arts and crafts um, sensibility. Um, but obviously the memorial um, you know, references classical um, ideals uh, very strongly. Um, so yeah, I think the, the, the chapel is, is, is almost a sort of a, an exception in Lambay, something that's so overtly classical. Um, yeah, I think the classicism is innate in the sort of clarity of the overall layout with the that, you know, the pure geometry of the circle mm. and the, the fact that all those paths radiate out, um, you know, from all the same centre. Um, I, think, I think even in the early houses, Stuart, his, his designs were always informed by a sense of order and geometry mm. that was worked into them. Um, Absolutely. Well, I'd like to thank everybody for listening and, and thank our <clears throat> thank our panelists. You've done an amazing job. Uh, I feel like I've had a little vacation on Lambay today. 
And if you uh, enjoyed the webinars, please feel, think about joining the Lutchens Trust or the Lutchens Trust America if you haven't already done so. And we'll be continuing our series next month, the second Thursday. And in addition, the Lutchens Trust is starting a lecture series that you'll be getting information about. The next one will be uh, Jane Ridley talking on Lutchens and Edwardian society. And that will be on March 23rd. So I'll be sending you uh, information about that. But thank you all again and uh, have a wonderful day. Thank you. Thanks.